a member, guest, visitor, or person. Whew. That basically means you're an adult. We expect you to take all of this as information, as ideas. We expect you to do your own due diligence and research the people that you're doing deals with just because you met them here. Doesn't mean that we approve a deal that they're doing. It just means that we all happen to have the same thing in common. We want you to do well. Hence the care if you understand. We are number one. <laughs> we are number one in deal flow, in networking, in education, and investor resources. There are a lot of free resources that we provide often like this particular meeting. There are also benefits to the paid membership, which I'll talk about in just a little bit. But before we dump, jump into uh, the paid membership, I want to also point out and brag that we are the largest trade association of real estate investors in the USA, including our partners. Uh, we have partners, by the way. Home Depot is one of them. Hence, can't you recognize any of these on the screen. These are some powerful companies that want to see you do well because their company is based on the success of real estate investors. So you also move the economy. Uh, before we dive into why you should be a member, let me talk about one of our highlighted members, uh, Sarah Ibram. So she's going to provide a market update. She's a licensed real estate professional in the Boston market. So she knows what's going on. Uh, Sarah, are you ready to rock? I am. Awesome. Thanks, Walter. Well. All right. So let me share my screen from here. <clears throat> All right. And I think I can just do a slideshow. Okay. I think it's working now. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so uh, just like we have been doing since the beginning of the year, uh, I kept... Um, you know, the market uh, recap, this is done on daily basis, but, you know, it still will give us an idea. I mostly uh, keep it to look at the uh, uh, available homes this year versus last year, contingent and on agreement back on the market and price changes. So that was January. Um, and then February kind of went down and also kind of keep an eye on the stock market. Um, and March, you know, things kind of were heading to where we wanted them to be. And uh, in April uh, as well, you know, 106. So as you can see, we have, um, one second. Yes, so from uh, March, you know, to, till, uh, till, uh, till April, um, the uh, numbers of homes that uh, went on contingent or under agreement actually has increased. Uh, and it's almost double the homes that went back on the market uh, price changes are actually, um, I want to say almost the same. Uh, but, you know, as this number, like, you know, if you divided this by the three counties, which are big, it's not really much. Um, uh, same thing that I do with the uh, interest rates. So in February, it, we were as low. So this is done weekly and it comes directly from Freddie uh, Mac. Um, hmm. And it, you know, it's done on a weekly basis. So uh, the last, I mean, the first week of February, it was very low at 6.09. Uh, and then it went up in March, 6.65. And it went down again. Um, this is the third week in a row that it kept going down. Um, what we see uh, in open houses, um, you know, buyers are very aggressive because still that 6 and 7% is considered historically low. Uh, and you know, and we don't we don't have houses uh, when spring market comes, um, which we are, which that's where we are right now. People go out more, um, so even with keeping the same inventory, we're gonna have actually more problem. And that's what uh, the chief economist uh, Sam Hodder is actually saying this week: is saying um, economic uncertainty continues to bring mortgage rates down over the last several weeks. Declining rates have brought borrowers back to the market but as the spring home buying season gets underway low inventory remains a key challenge for prospective buyers um so we we are still having the same um problem of of low inventory we're gonna feel it even more with the spring and summer market um what does that mean for us as investors um you know get get your projects done and and you know we need every house that you can uh put on the market I literally have people um, all the way, you know, West Mass, not that I do a lot of business there, but I even like now I have that right now. I have people in New Hampshire uh, and, you know, it's we, we have people that we can find houses for. 
so this is great news for, for any investor, especially that ones that do fix and flips. Uh, Ms. Walter is saying, I am licensed in Mass and New Hampshire, and you can uh, reach me. That's my contact information. I'll try to put it in the chat as well uh, throughout the night, um, and feel free to reach out, and then we can uh, you know, have a chat. Um, but I am also here to uh, talk to you about one of the benefits that you can exclusively get for being a, a, a Boston Media member. Uh, so basically, go to uh, if you go thanks Walter if you go to uh, any uh, you know if you go to Home Depot and you just you know say okay I want to enroll for your uh, rewards program uh, you're going to get some discounts but if you are one of our members you're going to get more uh, discounts that is not available for the regular people uh, for example our uh, members they get two percent rebate by annually on all purchases uh, the only catch is that you need to spend five thousand uh, uh, dollars minimum uh, per period. So, uh, Home Depot has a set rebate period. Uh, so January first until June thirtieth, and then July first until December thirty first. So we are still kind of in the middle of the of the first period. Uh, so you can you can join five thousand is very very easy. Uh, honestly, I thought with the new year and, and all the you know everything happening in the market that they would increase the, the that five thousand dollars to be like even a thousand per month, which is you know which is still going to be very uh, attainable. But that five thousand is easily in a single transaction, not to mention over six months. Uh, Home Depot would send you a gift card uh, if your rebates are uh, under a thousand dollars, and it will send you a check if it's a thousand dollars or more. Uh, and normally you get the rebates within 60 days from the closing period of, uh, of, of the rebate periods. Uh, and that will bring us to make sure that your uh, mailing address with Home Depot is up to date. Otherwise you're gonna just lose your rebates. Our members start at the gold tier. So normally if you are a, a Home Depot member, you need to spend $6,500 on paint in order to get uh, to get to the goal tier. Uh, with us, you don't have to do that. You just start right there um, and has nothing to do with the 5,000 rebate minimum. Uh, the rebate minimum is just to get that, is to get the rebate, to get that 2% rebate, but the 20% has nothing to do. You get that immediately at the checkout. But now if you pay with a registered card, so this Home Depot um, Pro Extra program Think of it as it's a rewards program. Like think of it as like CVS or Stop and Shop or any of the, uh, you know, the places that, you know, the more you shop, the more discounts and stuff you get. So it's the same thing. But Home Depot lets you uh, register a payment method. It could be a checking account, a credit card, a PayPal. Like really they offer you like, I don't know, five uh, payment methods that you could use. And uh, the only way to collect the rebates is through this payment method that you're registered. So let's say you have a Visa card that you're registered uh, and you, you know, at the checkout, you know, before you swipe your card at the pin pad, enter your phone number, and then the system will recognize that you're a, a Boston Area member and it will give you the 20% the at the checkout. Now, if you pay with that registered pay, uh, payment method, you're going to get the 2% you know, you're gonna accumulate that towards your five thousand dollars, and then you get it at the <clears throat> at the end of the six months uh, rebate. They, uh, you know, paying with a credit with a registered credit card or registered payment method, um, they have something called B two B, which allows you to track purchases for up to twenty four months, so you don't even have to worry about uh, you know keeping your receipts. Twenty percent. Um, uh, the the twenty percent of paint is applicable to paint stains and primer that's a gallon or more. <clears throat> Excuse me, it doesn't apply to any um, any quartz or spray or, or any of that. It has to be a gallon or more. Our members can get up to twenty percent of select Hampton Bay uh, kitchen and bath cabinets. The only uh, um, catch is that you need to purchase ten or more in a single transaction. And how it works is that you get 10% from National RIA and 10% from Home Depot. And both are stackable with any other store discounts. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
excuse me. I'm so sorry. Uh, so, um, Hang in there, Sarah. Sarah's Sorry. a real trooper, yeah. everybody. She, I have no idea. Yeah, she, <laughs> she had COVID a while ago, and here she is. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah. No, thank you for being patient. So also our uh, members, they get a, um, a volume pricing program or bid room. Uh, basically how this works is that you need to spend uh, $1,500 in a single transaction um, on large items. How it works is that you need um, to get a list of, uh, of large items of $1,500 or more, send it to the bedroom, and then it's going to come back um, with any applied discounts for up to 15%. Uh, and if you pay with a registered card, you get a 2%. So for 0 to 15, you get that at the checkout. The 2% rebate <clears throat> is, um, is accumulated to the end of the six months. I'm so sorry about that. You're good. Yeah, it happens to the best of us. I have been there many times, live in person, on stage, and just... Been like, can somebody bring me water? <laughs> I'm dying. <laughs> right? If it's not COVID, it's allergies. <laughs> nope. nope. So you, uh, so you know my obsession. I keep water on top of water at my desk just in case if I'm speaking. So <laughs> we don't, we don't run into this problem on my side. <laughs> uh, I think I'm if... drinking water. <laughs> there you go. If all that didn't convince you that it is a good deal uh, to join Boston Rea just for the Home Depot benefit, these numbers will um, give you a better idea. So in the last six months, um, Home Depot paid out to chapter members more than a half a million dollars in rebates. Average rebate per member was over $1,500. <laughs> and that's in just, I update these numbers every six months with the update of the you know, of the of the rebate period. So uh, this is just with that past cycle. So that $1,500 alone is enough to cover um, uh, Boston Rea, the annual Boston Rea member for years to come in, in one uh, six months rebate period. Um, I guess it's like no brainer <laughs> after all that to, to join uh, Kelly membership Rea is, is is your go-to. Uh, she's definitely very, you know, she will take care of you and how it works. So that's her number. You can call her, text her and say, you know, I want to join the Boston Rio <clears throat> or I want to verify if my membership expired. The Home Depot, even if you have been with us for years, that Home Depot needs to be done on a yearly basis. Uh, so it kind of expires on, on, on its own every year. So you, you need to do it again, even if you've been a member with us for years. So if you would like to verify your membership, Kelly will take care of that. After that, she will um, send me your information. And then we, uh, you know, we, we jump on a call. It takes like literally 10 minutes. There is no uh, special CRM that I use. I really do it from the Home Depot <laughs> website. But the information has to match exactly what we have with Boston Rhea. That's why you need to sign up first. Uh, thank you again. And I'm so sorry for all what happened. And have a great evening with a great speakers. Thank you. Awesome. Let's give Sarah Ibram a round of applause. Got through it. Uh, very cool. So we have sponsors at our events. Obviously, it's people that are useful to us, like uh, people who have money. Hence, care if you'd like private money, access to money to do deals. So believe it or not, sponsors, people who have money are also interested in you having money because uh, it's not always their money. Sometimes they have friends who put their money on the street and then need somebody to go and do a deal. Uh, who here has noticed that rich people don't like to work? Has anybody noticed that? They don't actually like to do things? Yes, that's how they got rich. They learned how to leverage 
money so that other people who are smart like yourselves who know how to invest in real estate will go and do the deals for them and pay them interest. The rich love interest. And so our sponsors have some money. They've invested it in uh, the Boston Rhea, and they're also really, really good at helping people find out the right projects for you to do. They will not invest money because they understand Warren Buffett's rule, don't lose money. They will not invest money in a bad project. So our sponsors, uh, Monteverde, Universal Capital, Legal Shield, J actually, well, Legal Shield's more on the uh, attorney side, insurance side, but uh, Leverage and JM Capital are all very good places to find out if your deal is even worth doing and also what the cost of money might be. I would encourage you to reach out to any of our vendors, any of our sponsors, and find out what they are charging. You may want to have a conversation with a few of them because some of them have different products. They can't all invest in the same types of real estate. So it's very important. If somebody says no, just because uh, that one person said no doesn't mean that somebody else won't say yes, but also be listening to why they're saying no. If it's a fundamental project issue, you may want to not do the deal. If money's afraid to do it, you should be afraid to do it. Hence, can't we understand? We follow the money. Yes, don't do things that lenders are afraid of. It's uh, <laughs> very scary. <laughs> uh, so we have our Boston Ria Association letter, email letter, a newsletter that goes out every single month. This is something you want to be a part of if you want to be ahead of schedule on what things are happening. So we know Massachusetts is considering uh, bring in rent control again. Now, it didn't work back in the day when they did it originally, but this is something that comes up during turbulent times, during recessions, and uh, right now that is on the docket. So in order to stay ahead of what's happening, you might want to get access to the newsletter that's going out. Uh, the way to sign up for that is go to Boston Real Estate Investors Association.com. The link is in the chat. Uh, Duncan did try to post the link, but the version that he posted doesn't have the hyperlink. So I posted the hyperlink. Give yourselves a round of applause. You're hanging out with smart people who know how to use technology. Uh, real estate is not just about being you know, great with people. You've also, and now today, you need technology. Uh, so the Boston RIA is here to get you started, to help you out. Uh, the reason the RIA is in existence, by the way, a lot of a lot of what the National RIA does is a um, is a nonprofit. The, the main National RIA is a not for profit organization. They do a lot of work on Capitol Hill. They do a lot of work making sure that um, people like us don't have to go and talk to the federal government and say, "Hey, don't pass that law, don't pass that rule." So the Real Estate Investor Association is more than just informing you and giving you information. They're also going and lobbying with the politicians to make sure that real estate investors still keep things like the 1031 exchange or uh, different tax codes that benefit us, as well as uh, when the moratorium was put into place, we did fight it. And we're also one of the reasons that it got ended as quickly as it did. If you, if you were holding real estate during that time, it may not have felt like it was quick, but it could have been longer. There were other people who wanted to keep it in place for a very long time. Hence the care if you understand uh, landlords, we needed that to end as fast as possible. <laughs> it was nice to have it finally finished. Uh, if you are active and local in the Boston market, we do have a local chapter. It is called the South Shore Real Estate Investors Association, and you have the opportunity to meet monthly. Uh, we don't have the date of the next subgroup, uh, but that is on the website. Right, Kelly? The subgroup meetings is up there. I know Carla uh, Lee is the one who runs that. And it's just a really great place to build relationships. So today on the virtual call, you're going to get a lot of information, but in person, you're going to be able to access and meet people and find out who's like-minded, who's maybe an attorney, a lender, an insurance person, or somebody who might be a wholesaler, find access to deals. And I know Sarah likes to go to these. So you'll meet Sarah in person as if that's not enough of a reason to go. Uh, for everybody who joins for the membership, there are a lot of uh, deals and opportunities. Uh, by the way, the membership sounds like it's worth like $10,000. It's not. It's it's worth that, but that's not worth charging. A uh, it's not going to cost you that to get in. I see Hannah just jump on the call. Let's give Hannah a round of applause. She's like our, our big helper in the Boston Rio between Kelly, Duncan, and Hannah. We wouldn't be here. And Sarah as well. Uh, so free entrance to monthly meetings. These live events that we're running are free to the Boston Rio members. The entrance to subgroup meetings, which there are a lot of them now. We've got a lot growing up around the Boston area. And Home Depot discount, the exclusive member discounts and benefits, and discount of workshops, which every Saturday do the 52 Weeks to Wealth. That is free for Boston Area members. That is Saturday at 10 o'clock. It's called, you can go register at I Build Millionaires once you become a member. Learn the sport, be a player, 
join tonight. The easiest way to get access, oh, it's, gonna, it's in the chat. If you look down there, there's a phone number. It's Kelly's phone number. This is the easiest way to get access. Text this number, 864-906-4111. And for everybody who does sign up, I'm going to give you access to the Recession Proof Conference, which is coming up at the end of the month. That's the 29th to the 30th. We're going to be diving into very specific real estate niches. Uh, this is a two-day conference. It's going to be from 12 o'clock to 5 o'clock on both days. I've got speakers who talk about multifamily. I've got speakers talking about mobile homes, residential assisted living. If you're looking to get involved in the silver tsunami, which, by the way, is the biggest, the baby boom generation is the biggest generation making a shift right now. And if you're missing out on the silver tsunami, then you might be missing out on what's making everybody else recession proof. Uh, me and my partners are doing very well financially right now, but there are a lot of people who are getting beat up. It's because they haven't shifted or making the adjustment. I will also be speaking. I brought in my tax accountant to be speaking about uh, the 1031 exchanges and the uh, and the other one is um, the deferment where we defer. We oh man, I'll tell you in a second. I got the spreadsheet in front of me over here. So we've got a lot of really cool uh, speakers coming out. Here we go. Residential assisted living. We've got IRA specialists. So if you've got money tied up in your IRA, you can actually use that for real estate. Cost segregation. That's what I was looking for. Cost segregation, evaluating deals, uh, how to fast track to millions, subject to. That's care if you're familiar with subject to, subject to existing financing. So we keep the financing in place. So we've got a speaker who's going to be talking about subject to and the technology you can use to stay ahead, obviously, including AI, how we're using AI in our business. Uh, I had to say it because it's a super hot topic for everybody right now. And it, we will be talking about how to address it so that you protect yourself. Sarah is amazing. And here's some more free stuff for our Boston Rea members. For people who pay with a membership, you get access to a lot of deals and discounts through each one of these vendors. If, if that's not enough, uh, price is not $10,000. It's not $900. It is... Uh, two, it's not $400 unless you're a couple. It's $280 for a single individual. Uh, if you are not a member of the Boston Ria, it is not just about the deals and the benefits. It's also about just helping a really good cause to help uh, landlords, if you plan on being one, to keep our properties at an affordable rate of rent and make sure that our expenses aren't going through the roof. So for everybody who knows that this is something they want to do, that they're getting value from tonight, then we appreciate you uh, joining the membership and getting into uh, the Boston RIA as a member. So for all of our members, let's give you a big round of applause for uh, all the benefits you're getting, all the discounts you're getting, and for supporting a great cause. It's kind of like PBS. You watch the channel, but you don't donate. Do you really exist? I question it myself. So please make sure that you consider becoming a member, especially if you're active. We've spent, uh, saved over $1,500 just from the Home Depot discount alone and Equity Trust. We've raised millions of dollars through Equity Trust by helping our clients untap equity in their properties. Hands camera, if you could use more capital from other people, OPM. So those connections are really important, really helpful. Uh, very quickly, haves, wants, needs. Drop in the chat. What is it you're looking for? Are you looking for deals? Are you looking for money? Are you looking for partners who can go and do deals? Are you looking for an agent, a wholesaler? Drop in the chat quickly. This is your chance. I want to make sure that everybody gets an opportunity to share. Networking is, again, really important because real estate is not a real estate business. It's a people business. It's all about who you know. And in fact, I'll say it's not about who you know. It's who knows you that helps you do deals in real estate. Because I know Elon Musk, and he's never sent me a deal. But I have purchased Tesla stocks, and that is why it's important to be known by other people. OPM, I like it, Jable. So when you're looking for other people's money, point out what type of deals that you do, what kind of deals you're investing in, so that money knows what it's getting invested in. Also, you might want to drop your contact information, because believe it or not, there's no way to contact you outside of this beautiful room. So if you forget to drop your contact information, any person who wants to talk to you can't find you. And so if we understand how simple that is, it could be a phone number or an email address, just drop it and let people know what you're looking for. Uh, looking for wholesalers, excellent Anna. Uh, Jable, uh, looking for other people's money. And for lenders who don't know what other people's OPM stands for, that means other people's money. That's your money. 
Uh, Glenn Hazard now has dropped his phone number, but not dropped what he was looking for. So uh, it's it's okay. COVID happened a little while ago. We're a little out of shape when it comes to networking. Uh, I will tell you, I make more money through networking than anything else. In fact, uh, you can find me on Facebook. And I am always looking for opportunities to invest. Me and my partners manage about $5 million of real estate uh, funds, funds that are allowed to be allocated to real estate deals. So if you're looking for uh, money outside of uh, what hard money provides, we're very expensive, by the way. We do charge 15% interest. So just, just to be clear, we're very expensive and we do charge points. But if you need money, uh, you can find me on Facebook, send me a message. Hey, Jable says it's perfect. Cool. See, I said we're not right for everybody, but somebody's willing to be uh, to be overcharged. I will tell you, the sponsors are much cheaper than me. So <laughs> just so we're very clear. Awesome. Now we're going. Now everybody gets it. Excellent. Multi Small multifamily strip malls. That's Tracy. She's got her contact information out there. Perfect. Uh, Jable, you're going to want to drop your contact. Karen, you know, oh, there you go. Looking for a mentor or coaching. Excellent, Karen. Uh, so you can, somebody will send you a link to a mentorship program that we've got created that is uh, from the Boston area specifically. And wholesaling, look at, looking to do wholesales. That's a, a training thing. You're going to need some uh, training to get that going. I like it. Excellent. Manny De Silva. So Manny De Silva buys houses dot, at, at gmail.com. Talk about an email address that tells you what you do. That's clever. I like that. Uh, small business and real estate lending. Excellent. Two units. So Glenn is looking for two units. He dropped his contact information up there. So keep the networking going. And while the networking is rocking and rolling, I'm going to introduce our amazing speaker. So tonight we have economist Dr. Paul Mueller and wealth strategist Jason K. Powers on the call. You've probably seen their smiling faces here, keeping an eye on everybody, seeing how interactive this room is. Uh, Jason will be demonstrating how you can also warehouse your wealth in a unique financial vehicle that has guarantees and safety while providing ready access to your money, allowing you to take over the bank, uh, bank function of your life, thus becoming your own bank in life. Let's give both of our powerful speakers a big round of applause and welcome to the Boston RIA. <laughs> hey, thanks, guys. I'm excited to be here. I know uh, Paul is too. Let's see. I got a lot of faces on the screen. Where'd Paul go? There's Paul. Uh, yeah, everybody's here. Appreciate appreciate the opportunity and uh, being asked to speak tonight. Uh, so do I have uh, hosting privileges to share at this point? Do we know? You do indeed, my friend. It was one of the first things I did. I had to make sure you were up ah, and running. We can do it. Let's try it. Let's try it and get that up here. So I'm going to share, share. All right. You let me know when you got it up there for you. We could see it. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, hey, let's let's dive right in. Uh, I I love I love being on these uh, real estate investor calls because that's my background as well. And I still do it. And, and I, I love pairing what I do, let's say for a career. So, so with real estate investing. And so I'm super excited all the time when I get to teach other real estate investors uh, about what I do. Cause I'm, I'm man, if I'd have heard about this, when I first got started, I I'd be in a different, different ball game, but uh, so a lot to cover today, and then uh, I want to cover kind of understanding banks. We've talked about money to, tonight already, right? We, we need money. We have money. We need money to move, right? We don't want it sitting there. Sitting there is bad. Uh, so we're going to understand banks. We need to, we we're going to talk a little bit about what's going on recently in the banking crisis, the Silicon Valley Bank collapse, and um, understand the economics behind that, and, and that's where where Paul is gonna just make me look ignorant to the wealth of knowledge that he has with this stuff and and and, and it's fascinating and and then understanding the alternatives what else can we do you know so let's dive right in uh, where do we put our money right we put it in banks okay put our money in banks and so um, we don't just want it sitting there but what are banks doing with their money with our money when we put it in banks? We ever looked into that? There's this thing called fractional reserve banking uh, that that banks are doing, and and that is basically saying it's a it's a banking system that requires banks to hold only a portion of money deposited uh, with them as reserves. So 
So as we hear it, pre-COVID, as we hear it, heard it, um, it was demonstrated as, hey, your money goes in the bank, but banks have to keep a, a percentage of it on hand, right? They have to keep it um, on reserve. And so we hear that and we go, hey, that's great. Banks are going to have some money in reserve. Uh, what we don't do is ask, what does that mean? What are those numbers? You know, um, interestingly, prior to uh, 1992, the reserve requirement was only 12% with banks. And then in 92, they lowered that to 10%. So it's been 10% for a long time. I'll explain what that means in a minute. And then enter COVID. They lowered that reserve requirement for banks down to zero. Okay. And why is that a big deal? And why is that a big deal for our money? So let me show you fractional reserve banking in play. So say you have three guys go into the bank that each deposit $1,000 a piece. That's $3,000 got deposited in the bank. Now they keep 10% on reserve. So 300 goes into the reserve and then they loan out the 90% of it. So 2,700 of it gets loaned out. Now those people who got the $2,700, where do they put their money, right? They put it back into the banking system. So what's the bank do at this time? They keep, they uh, put 10% on reserve so $270 and then they loan out the rest of it. So $2,430. Those guys do it again. They go out, deposit their money. Bank keeps 10% on reserve. You get the idea, right? So at this point now, $8,260 has been deposited, but only $813 actually exist. Does that make sense? Because of fractional reserve banking. So they've loaned out all of this money and every time it gets redeposited into the system, that money gets reloaned out. And so there's this massive influx of, of phantom money, I call it, right? that's out there and that's why you have things like this how many of you remember this movie right and i don't think you can hear it can you hear it right now thumbs up if you can hear it nope okay i did it But it was this scene in Mary Poppins, even where, where the kids like, give me back my money. And, and, and they would take the money and then someone else sees, oh, they're not giving him his money. Well, I want to get my money. And so they run to the bank and they get all their money. And that's what happens. That's how we got the bank runs. Guys, how many of you were around in 2008 when there was a bank runs and banks were locking their doors. The money wasn't there. Right. So um, that, that's, that's what was happening. And now enter Silicon Valley Bank. So uh, at this time, I would love for uh, Dr. Paul Mueller to come on. He's going to kind of take us through this next section. Uh, Paul, Paul is a professor of economics at King's College, uh, uh, an author, understands the financial markets and crisis and um, Austrian economists and and uh, just a just a fantastic mind uh, for the banking and economic side of things. Thanks, Jason, and uh, an amateur real estate investor as well. But um, I own a, a bed and breakfast in the mountains in Colorado, which is where I am now. Um, well, thank you. Uh, thanks everyone for joining here. Uh, so, as, as Jason mentioned, my background is is economics, and and I've written and studied financial markets. So, I'm just going to walk through briefly. Again, many of you are probably some of you are more familiar, some of you are less familiar with what happened in Silicon Valley Bank uh, a few weeks ago, but I'm going to kind of walk through what happened there. It's sort of a classic bank run, but there was a lot of things that happened to set this up. And the biggest thing that set this up was really low interest rates by the Federal Reserve in response to COVID, and then the creation of large amounts of money where the Federal Reserve uh, pumped a bunch of money into the economy. And the way they do that is they basically create money, whether it's physical or electronic, and they go out and they buy, in particular, they, they buy bonds. So U.S. government bonds, mortgage-backed security bonds of various kinds. And so what they're doing is they're basically 
taking bonds out of the market and putting cash into the market. And they buy those bonds primarily from banks. And so they're, they're infusing banks with cash and then that gets lent kind of this fractional reserve way that Jason was describing. So you have this, this huge growth in the amount of cash, the amount of money in the system, you've got really low interest rates. So something that not everybody knows about Silicon Valley Bank is the Silicon Valley Bank's deposits nearly tripled from 2020 to 2023. Uh, that is to say, you know, when it when it collapsed, it was around 250 billion. Two years earlier, it had been under 100 billion in assets. So it it just exploded um, in this low interest rate environment and this this high cash environment, which favors startups. It favors um, you know SPACs and other kinds of investments, which SVB specialized in. So you have all of this cash. You have these low interest rates. Um, that sets the stage for the panic that happened uh, a few weeks ago. As Jason mentioned, the, the, what banks do when you deposit their money is they lend it out. So some banks will specialize in you know, traditional mortgages, 30-year, 15-year mortgages to, to home buyers. Sometimes they'll do uh, commercial lending. Sometimes they'll specialize in business lending. And then what a lot of banks will do as well, and this is you know, where SVB got into trouble, is a lot of banks will take their excess cash and they will buy interest bearing instruments. So bonds. So they'll, they'll take, you know, billions of dollars and they'll buy, you know, treasury bonds that are, are paying interest and that mature over time. Uh, so SVB and SVB wasn't alone in this, but they bought tens of billions of dollars of government bonds in 2020, 2021. And the thing about bonds is the price of a bond and the interest rate are inversely related. What that means is when interest rates are low, bond prices are high. But then when interest rates go up, bond prices fall. And so what happened to SVB and what has happened to a lot of banks is the, the value of the bonds that they hold has declined significantly. As you all know, the Federal Reserve has increased interest rates rapidly over the last 12 months. And so every time that interest rate ticks up, the market value of the bond drops. And so part of what triggered this crisis is SVB sold a bunch of their bonds to, to raise some liquidity to raise cash. Uh, but in the sales, they had to realize significant losses. They, they bought these bonds for $20 billion, and then they had to sell them for like $18.4 billion or 18.2. So they took like a 1.8 billion or 9% loss on these bonds that they sold. And the other thing that they did, this was just a few days before they collapsed, besides selling those bonds and taking a loss, they also publicly said, hey, we're going to try to raise more equity capital. We're going to issue more shares. We need to raise more money. And those two things together sent you know, bad signals to different investors. So you may all know who Peter Thiel is, who's an influential guy in Silicon Valley who advises lots of companies and has a lot of money. Basically, I think what happened is he saw this and he started looking at Silicon Valley Bank's books and said, you know what, there's a lot of risk here. Um, there are other losses. This $1.8 billion loss is maybe just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, and you know what, if they fail, we're going to have a bunch of money that's uninsured. So he told his companies, advised them to, to pull their money out of Silicon Valley Bank. And then they all have friends, sold their friends to. And in a 24-hour period, you had about $42 billion dollars withdrawn from SVB, uh, one of the, the largest bank runs, maybe the largest bank run in, in history, uh, because all that's electronic and was withdrawn. And then you get into this problem. So it's, it's kind of like the Mary Poppins example where everybody wants their money back. SVB had a lot of cash. They had like $18 billion on hand, uh, but that's less than $42 billion. So what they ended up having to do is they had to go liquidate their holdings, right? So imagine, you know, you have your real estate holdings and all of a sudden you have to come up with, you know, a million dollars tomorrow. Well, you're not going to get the best price for your house or your fourplex or whatever. You're going to find someone, please buy this. And if you have to sell it in a day or immediately, you, you take whatever you get. And so this is what we call a fire sale. And so what also happened in this, this bank run is SVB, as it was trying to raise capital and liquidity was taking, you know, basement, selling their, their bonds for basement prices and were losing money hand over fist. Uh, and so eventually regulators just stepped in on that Friday uh, and took it over because they're like, the longer this goes on, the more money you lose. Um, 
So you have this massive bank. It's it's one of the largest banks to fail. Yes, yeah, since 2008, it's it's second only to Washington Mutual, uh, and it failed in you know 24 hour, 24 to 48 hours. Uh, you know, 250 billion dollar bank wiped out. That's part of why it was so dramatic uh, that it happened very very quickly. Um, you know, the other issue that people were were wrestling with with Silicon Valley Bank failing, and part of why it caused a national stir is, um, as you know, there's something called the, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. So that there's a, a federal agency that insures deposits at banks, but only up to $250,000. If you have more than $250,000 and your bank fails, your money is not insured. And what's interesting about Silicon Valley Bank is that uh, something like 90% of their deposits were business deposits and were over the $250,000 level were uninsured. Uh, that's part of why they had such a big run. You had businesses with 5 million, 10 million, 20, 30 million. Some, there was even some places that, that were warehousing like a billion dollars at SVB. And so very quickly you, you pull those large accounts and you, you lose money very quickly. So uh, this this gives you a sense of bank failures and the size. So you've got Washington Mutual, that's the biggest, but then you've got Silicon Valley and Signature Bank, which was also pretty large with less press, but both of those failed the same week and together had a little bit more assets than Washington Mutual. So what you can also see here is that lots of banks fail. Uh, usually they're smaller, but lots of banks fail. Most of the time it goes unnoticed because most of the time, most people have under $250,000. And so when a bank fails, the FDIC steps in, it takes over, it operates the bank just like normal, and then it kind of liquidates and tries to sell off. And from a, a depositor standpoint, it's business as usual. And that's why most of us don't look at the books of the banks we keep our money at, right? Because why would we bother? Our money is insured. So these bank failures happen on a, on a fairly regular basis. And, and the problem, you know, again, it's the, it's the twin problems. You know, real estate investors have this to a lesser extent but it's the twin problems of liquidity and solvency, right? That, that is to say, are your assets worth more than your liabilities? And what are your obligations in terms of cash you have to pay? And what's your ability to, to meet those obligations, to service your debt? And the thing about banks and the thing about deposits is it's on-demand money. It's as if somebody said, here, I'll give you a million dollars to do your real estate project, uh, but I can ask you to pay that million dollars back to me anytime I want at a moment's notice, right? As you all know, that's not a great way to borrow uh, if, if you have to do that, unless you can, you're highly diversified and large like a bank and you can, you kind of have your liquid in liquid assets. So part of the conversation now that's going on at the federal level is how much should we insure all deposits, right? So the, the concern when, when Silicon Valley Bank failed is that all of the uninsured deposits that were still there, this was still, you know, 100 billion plus dollars, were basically frozen. So if you were a company and you had $10 million there, uh, you couldn't access it Friday that it was taken over. And the concern was technically this is not insured. It's going to be, you're going to be tied up in the bankruptcy process and eventually you'll get some or most of that money back. But until a judge and has kind of worked all that out, your money's frozen, how are you going to pay your employees? or pay your rent or do anything else. And, and so this is why people were so like terrified in Silicon Valley. Like basically your company could have 10, 20, $30 million, but you effectively might have zero come Monday because it was uninsured, it's frozen and it's tied up in the bankruptcy process of SVB. Uh, and by the way, this affects not just Silicon Valley companies there. I have a brother who does a lot of real estate, short-term rent, has a short-term rental business. And he uses something called Bill.com to, to run dozens and dozens of payments every week. And Bill.com banked with SVB. And so he got a notice Friday afternoon saying, uh, we might not be able to process any of your payments this week. And so he was like, I was like, where's the checkbook? Do we have addresses for everybody? So the, the potential fallout from this could have been huge. And that's partially why um, various federal agencies stepped in and said, well, actually, we're going to guarantee all the money. We're going to make sure everyone has access to the money. Um, but then the broader question is, well, who's going to pay for it, right? The, the problem is these losses with bonds and other things that the bank took. If it doesn't come from uninsured depositors, who's going to take those losses? The shareholders were wiped out already. So then the question is, are, are bondholders going to take a, a bigger haircut than before? Uh, that's bad 
because if you give them a, an illegal haircut they weren't expecting, they're not going to lend to banks in the future. Uh, and this actually happened when Washington Mutual failed. They did that sort of thing. They basically bailed out uninsured depositors using bondholders' money. And bond markets for banks basically shut down the next week and, and worsened the financial crisis in 2008 quite a bit. So I, I don't remember, I don't know the details of how they're paying for it. I think the FDIC is chalking up a good part of the money. The Fed has engaged in some programs of lending. We don't need to go into the details there. It's kind of in the weeds. But the question now becomes, uh, what kind of insurance should we have for banks at a, at a national level? Who's going to pay for it? Are banks going to pay for it? Is that going to come in terms of more fees for when we use banks, um, you know, we can kind of, of leave that aside. Uh, but the 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 other thing I want to mention here uh, that maybe is of more relevance to, to you all and some of the fallout here is the role of the Federal Reserve in all of this. So as you know, Federal Reserve is front and center in terms of interest rates. It's been raising interest rates pretty dramatically. It's been trying to pull money out of the economy. So they've been reversing. Instead of buying bonds with new money they create, they've been selling bonds they hold and pulling money out of the economy and just kind of extinguishing it to try to reduce inflation, right? The inflation we've seen over the last year. So they've been raising interest rates, pulling money out of the economy to try to reverse inflation with um, what looks like some success. But now over the last three or four weeks, um, they've lent well in excess of $100 billion to, to the banking system. Um, and so they basically, because there's been so many demands of people moving money around, pulling out of regional banks, pulling out of local banks, worried that their money's not going to be safe. The Fed has engaged in, in massive lending programs and has injected a huge amount of liquidity back into the market. Um, and so one of the questions you know, that I, I think about and talk to my students is, I don't know what effect this will have on inflation. They're kind of doing two things now. They're raising rates to try to cut back on inflation, and they were pulling money out, so those are working together. But now they're putting money back in. And so the question is, what's the effect of new money in the economy and the banking system versus rising interest rates on inflation? I don't know. I don't have a crystal ball uh, of exactly what's going to happen. But it, it has changed the dynamics uh, significantly when it comes to monetary policy. And, and you know, I think it will affect inflation one way or another. Um, the other thing to note, and, and this is going to be, you know, Jason's going to talk about this a little bit more in a second, is the part of the reason this matters, too is thinking about the implications of interest rates, weaknesses in large banks, and to and indirectly federal government borrowing and spending. Uh, because these things are all connected. So the interest rate not only affects the cost of mortgages or, or banks, but it also affects the costs that the federal government has to pay on the debt that it holds of you know $31 trillion, or rather that it owes, not that it holds, that it owes. Um, so interest rates had to have a big impact on national finances. We're going to see the federal government spend, you know, three, four, five hundred billion dollars more than they spent last year just paying interest on the debt this year. Um, it's it's uh, it's like a new massive spending program just to service the debt that the federal government has. And and the reason why this matters, the reason I bring this up, and again, Jason's going to talk about this some too is that uh, the, the financing of banks and the financing of the federal government is closely connected to the Federal Reserve's willingness to, to buy bonds, to, to put more money into the system. And so in, in a, a strange kind of way, greater debt when it comes to the federal government and weaknesses in the banking system actually can have inflationary pressure. They can actually reduce the value of the dollar over time. And so part of what he's going to talk about and, and part of how I got connected with him, I, I'm, I'm you know, one of his, his clients as well, is what are various avenues for hedging uncertainty around interest rates and uncertainty around inflation, around, you know, government spending? Um, how do you take into account, you know, the, the kind of inflation risk? You know, we've all seen significant inflation over the last year and a half. Uh, what if that comes back? What if there's more of it? How do we kind of think about various financial instruments that that can help us hedge against that? And, um, you know, what are alternatives to keeping lots of our money in banks that that maybe don't pay us a ton of interest when there are there are better options for for warehousing our money? Um, 
So I think that's all I have at the moment. I'll turn it back over to Jason. I might chime in again here and there. And, and if you have questions, you know, feel free to, to type questions in the chat and we can go back to them later. But uh, there's your, your crash course in SVB, you know, Federal Reserve interest rates, um, you know, the way that the Fed creates money to lend to banks or creates money to buy federal government debt. Um, you know, there's this funny note on Monopoly that in the rules of Monopoly, it actually says the bank never goes bankrupt. They just, you just write out that they have more money. You just literally create new money on slips of paper. Uh, and that's ironically kind of how our financial and monetary system work um, in, a, in a fiat system. So <clears throat> let's see. Yeah, this is, this just shows what I said earlier that, um, you know, Silicon Valley Bank had very few deposits below that $250,000 mark. Most of their deposits were uninsured as opposed to the larger banks. Um, so I'm trying to think of what else. Yeah, here we go. So we'll turn it over to, to Jason here to talk about some of that debt side of uh, the federal government. And that, that applies pressure on the Federal Reserve to, to buy government debt, to create new money, or what we call monetizing the debt is the, the term we use and uh, what kind of implications those have. Yeah, and I think it's important, you know, we talk about, and, and we will tie this back into real estate investing, but it's it's important to understand what our money's been doing and what it's going to do as far as uh, the big picture, right? And, and then how do we protect ourselves from that? How do we hedge ourselves against these problems, right? The banking problem we're starting to see now, um, the inflation problem we're starting to see, and so forth. But but backing out just a little bit further from banks is, is U.S. debt as a whole. If you've never been to this website, go to usdebtclock.org. It, it shows live rolling numbers of U.S. debt. It is both fascinating and terrifying at the same time. Yeah, it, and it's, it's, it's interesting. So, so I, I always go in here and try to update my numbers because the numbers are constantly changing. Every time I do a presentation, the numbers are drastically different. And I was taken aback when I did one back in October. I did a snapshot and you see it here. You see things like US national debt, you know, at 30 trillion, right? And 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 then I did another one in February and I pulled the numbers again. And in four months, we saw things like US federal spending had gone up 20 billion, gone up 20 billion in four months. You saw things like, oh, they're the the deficit had increased 300 billion in four months. There's factors, right? But contrast that with like way back in 1980, it was the total was 40 billion. Uh, now it's 1.4 trillion. So, so uh, U.S. federal budget deficit was defined as the difference between the total amount spent by Congress versus the revenue received by the IRS. Uh, it's, so it's fascinating. You know, you start looking at it. It's not just the government, right? We like to point fingers. U.S. Personal debt has increased 683 billion in four months. Yeah. That's it, it, it's they're mind boggling numbers. And, and one of the most interesting things I thought was seeing this contrast, which we'll allude to in a little while, is this US commercial bank revenue received from interest is 36 billion it went up 36 billion in four months but the u.s commercial bank revenue paid on interest bearing accounts only went up seven and a half billion in four months that means they the uh, banking systems right right they're up 29 billion in four months okay so we're talking billions and trillions i, I want you to picture uh money for a second if you spent one dollar per second okay one dollar per second you would spend eighty six thousand four hundred dollars in a day thirty one and a half million dollars in a year anyone want to get in the chat or, or unmute real quick any wild guesses how many years to spend one trillion dollars i'll wait for like two answers quick unmute if you want to guess or type it in there how many years would it take to spend one trillion dollars? Five, four, three, two. With that, five years. Five years. Okay. Okay. Good guess. Good guess. Thirty-one thousand seven hundred and nine years. 
to spend oh. one billion dollars <laughs> if you spent one dollar per second. Total U.S. debt right now. Think about this: ninety-four trillion. So just context, like we can't even fathom that kind of money. Can't, you know. Well, and just a quick distinction here: the ninety-four trillion is sort of uh, taking into account future obligations and promises and different kinds of, of um, you know, programs like Social Security and Medicare. So the the outstanding debt is a little over like thirty-one trillion, but is projected to climb and grow based on obligations and and the way things are going to to grow to ninety four. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it mind boggling. But go to go to usdebtclock.org. Take a look. Uh, it'll spin your spin your head. Um, so so what about our own finances? What should we do about our own finances? Right. Uh, uh, I think I think uh, reasons were mentioned earlier why we want to get into real estate. Right. And and everybody's got their own various reasons, but but I think securing your financial future is the big picture for most of us who are doing real estate. So I always like to you know we say of course diversification yes. Um, what kinds of things do we want to do to diversify uh, our money that is safe and mostly safe? And I will never talk about investment products. Because uh, I believe that is like gambling, and if you want to gamble, gamble with with money you you are willing to lose. Um, it has its benefits; it has its place, right? But anyway, diversification: build up a stockpile of currency, you know, your money uh, that you have available right now. Gold and silver is a great place right now. You see it skyrocketing, but that is something that will always be tradable. Even crypto, if you want to get into it, understand it, right? Um, you know, I, I know, I know Paul likes, likes uh, crypto a little bit and, 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 and I think it's a potentially good vehicle for those who will take the time to understand it. Um, and then of course, real estate, which I say, I like to say, get into recession proof housing. If you're getting into real estate, uh, what's going to be around even amidst recessions, you know, you can, you can throttle up a little bit and get into the more risky uh, things, if you will, the short-term stuff and what have you, but but big picture, long-term recession proof housing. I think that's why um, the rental mark we like rentals so much. It's like why we like multifamily so much now, um, and and it's a it's an amazing vehicle to utilize. Uh, and there's another thing called we I call it infinite banking, alternate warehouse. Where else can we warehouse our wealth that will grow? in a safe environment. So enter the infinite banking concept. If you've never read this book, I'm going to give you a website later. You can go buy it, read it. Uh, you can go online and grab it. 92 pages, easy read. Uh, it's amazing. It changed my life. Okay. Um, it is what got me to change what I do with my money, change how my money flows. I'm going to talk about it a little bit today, and then I'm going to give you an opportunity. We're going to do an expanded version of it here in a couple of weeks uh, so we can go really in-depth and you can understand it. Best place to warehouse your wealth, the benefits of infinite banking. It grows uninterrupted, your money, even while you're using it elsewhere. So you park your money, you're moving your money in through to a vehicle, and it's going to grow even though you, are, you have it out being used elsewhere. Um, there are income tax-free growth opportunities within it. Use it now, retire later. It's something you can use now throughout your whole life and then retire on later with tax benefits to it, right? It's safe from investment booms and busts. It's not an investment product. We're not talking about let's find creative, unique uh, investment products that we can utilize. We're not, we're not locking our money up. Um, we have the ability to borrow against it all the time, and it's not tied to our credit. Also, um, the unstructured loans, when you borrow against this, if they're unstructured loans, you get to decide the loan terms. How many of you would love to borrow from a lender and him say, you tell me how much you want to pay back, how long you're going to take, and what kind of interest you want to pay me? Uh, <laughs> I would, right? It's got generational wealth transfer benefits tied to it and, and so much more, okay? What is it? That's everybody's question. What is it? Okay. 
The vehicle through which we show you how to do this is properly structured dividend paying whole life insurance from a mutual carrier. Okay. Now, I am wordy about it because I am particular about it. It is not. Please do not get off this call. Call your buddy who's an insurance agent and say, hey, I heard about this thing. Um, start me a whole life policy. I want to bank with it. <laughs> and he's going to get, I've, I've, I say it because I had people do it. I've had people do it. And then they always call me afterward and they're like, what, what is wrong with this policy? It's not working like you said it was. And this person wasn't trained on how to do it right, how to structure it right. Okay. Properly structured, dividend paying from a mutual carrier. Now, there are two types of insurance companies. Okay. There's stock owned companies and there's mutual companies. As a policy owner, you are one of the owners of the company, thus entitled to the profits, which come in the form of dividends. Okay, so that's why I say dividend paying from a mutual carrier. And then I'm talking about whole life insurance. I'm not talking about term, index, universal life, variable, universal life, all these different kinds of life insurance. I'm talking about strictly whole life insurance and what it can do. Okay. Now, it is properly structured. It is something we want to structure right. So you have access to cash right away. Not, this is not, as I say, your grandparents' old life insurance policy where you got to start it and you can't touch that sucker for five to 10 years and you have negligible benefit from it. It is not the whole life insurance policy that certain financial gurus out there rail against. It is structured different. These particular people on, on uh, the interwebs that rail against whole life are misrepresenting this because it's not, they're explaining it different and it's structured different. So whole life, it's been around since the 1700s. This is nothing new. We didn't come out and, you know, we're not, we're not gurus who invented this new idea that nobody's ever heard of, right? Um, Nelson Nash, the book I referenced, Becoming Your Own Banker, he put words to it, right? He understood how it was working, how you could restructure it and put words to it, okay? Whole life, it actually started out as the Corporation for Relief of Poor and Distressed Widows and Children of Presbyterian Ministers. That's actually a shortened version of the old name. <laughs> and it, it started out because ministers were spending the whole life in ministry. And then when they would pass away, they were no longer supported by the church. And then the family no longer had an income and was left destitute. And so that's actually how it got started. They needed to find a way to support the families even after. Who utilizes cash value whole life insurance? Banks. Banks carry billions of dollars in cash value whole life insurance. If you go look at their, um, their uh, annual statements, their balance sheets, it is a tier one asset on there. Okay. A couple of years ago, these are numbers from about two years ago. Bank of America owned $20 billion in cash value whole life insurance on its VIPs, on its executives. They carry a lot of it. So what do they know? Who else understands it? These companies understand it. These owners understand it, right? If you start digging around, you start finding different stories. It's really neat. Uh, uh, as you start digging around. So there's an old story about Walt Disney. He couldn't get enough of a bank loan um, to build a theme park based on a mouse. And he went and borrowed from his policy and finished funding it. Ray Kroc, when he bought out the McDonald brothers, he had two whole life policies. He used one of them for um, paying key employees and another one he used to uh, start a marketing campaign on his newest mascot. Anybody? Mr. Ronald McDonald, right? Started with whole life, accessing his whole life insurance policy. Who else knows about it? These gentlemen, okay? They know something. Interesting article on Biden, when he had to disclose his finances, talked about how he owns zero investment products and six whole life policies. Now that starts, that's a, you start perking up. You're going, what is he, what's he doing? He doesn't own any investment products. His wife owns some, but he doesn't own any and he owns six whole life policies. What's he doing? We don't know. They don't tell us. So people are using it. But as I say, don't just run out and grab a policy, right? <laughs> it's, it's, we spend so much time educating people and then you're ready to implement. And then you know what you're doing, but you're gonna implement. So I am gonna offer just for you guys, uh, actually we'll just keep it close to Boston Rhea members on the 19th at seven o'clock. 
Uh, you can take a picture of that QR code. It'll take you there. Uh, we're going to do, I'm going to do another webinar, have more time to kind of dive in to infinite banking specifically. What is it? Why does it work? How is it structured? We're going to see behind the scenes uh, and, and talk about that. So um, we're going to talk about, you know, these three kinds of people, right? There's the debtor. Those are people who we, we like to go into debt and then we pay things off over time. Let's see if I can get a pointer over here. We pay things off over time. We get back to zero. We Let's take a car, for example, okay? We finance a car. Pay it off over time, get back to zero. Finance another car, pay it off over time, get back to zero. And we do this throughout our whole life, right? That's the debtor. The saver does the opposite. He says, hey, I'm going to save up for this car until I have enough money, and then I'm going to buy that car and go back to zero. I'm going to save up again for the next car down the road, buy it, go back to zero. So we do that throughout their life. What I want to teach you is how to be this wealth creator where you can create this financial velocity that can literally last for generations. That is not an exaggeration. Okay. It is a vehicle through which you can use your real estate investing. You run your business, take over the banking function in your life. You become the bank. Okay. I'm going to walk you through various examples of this webinar. I'm going to show you how a gentleman, a client had $109,000 in bad debt, credit cards, student loans. He was on a 30 year plan to pay it off. We changed the flow of his money. We came up with a strategy using only existing money, not how much extra money can we come up with. We used all existing money, changed the flow start a policy and built a very specific strategy through which got him nine years debt free and he had ninety five thousand dollars in cash value to use for other things he went from 30 years to nine years totally debt free and had ninety five thousand to show for it and that'll take him through the rest of his life okay i'm going to show you that my favorite one is I'm going to show you guys, take you through the life of a real estate investor. Uh, if you started out wholesaling, you know, we changed the flow of the money. A couple of years later, you get into fix and flips and how you'll build up enough to start replacing your lender, right? Start replacing your hard money lender, private money lender over time, where you borrow from yourself and start financing the construction side. Then as you build it up, you start financing the whole deal. And then you have enough, you start doing buy and holds. You're putting down payments on buy and holds. I'm going to show you how a guy uh, uh, took enough, bought four rental properties, uh, and then he set it up so he could buy another rental property every two years. Every two years, another one, another one, another one, another one. And then 10 years later, he's got half a million dollars in there. He can do a commercial property deal now. And how he built up 148000 net after costs of his premiums and everything, net grow, tax-free in cash value. And then how he took that same policy, that same vehicle, and it took him into retirement and he'll live on that retirement, supplementing his retirement, 100,000 a year, 20 years, income tax-free, okay? And it's legal, the IRS says it's okay. But I'll show you why show you how it happens and why uh, at this webinar. Um, and then take it even further, even after retirement, what does he leave behind? He'll leave behind this vehicle through which generational wealth happens, privatized family banking, right? You start your own private family banking system and, and where that can get you. Okay, so we're gonna, we'll dive into the nuts and bolts of it. I know we're, you're drinking from a fire hose right now, but these are the big examples I wanna get through at the next one. So we can really break it down and have you understand it. Um, you know, kind of spinning back money back back to to tying it back to government spending and, and what are banks doing and how are banks making money? I know Paul wanted to say a quick bit here about this. Yeah, just the the comment on it. Like what what I like about it is you really are kind of replacing the bank function. So basically the, the whole life insurance company and, and policy does some similar stuff to banks, only you are not only a depositor whose money is being used. In fact, you are an owner, so you get dividends, any money that is earned you know, in the investments that the whole life company makes, 
you have a claim to. And then you also have direct access to the cash value. And so you can, you can basically take out a loan against your policy anytime and the terms are very simple, the interest is low. And because you're borrowing against what you've put in and the cash value, um, the, the whole life company, they don't have to check your credit scores. They don't ask what your income is. They don't ask what the project is. They're, you're drawing down basically the, the cash value of your plan while still having that plan and still having that ownership in the, uh, the insurance company. So you're kind of getting the interest and you're also getting to some extent the profit that banks will get. But when you're a depositor to bank, you just get a piece of the interest, none of the profit, none of the overhead. Um, and so it's really kind of using that as a vehicle without taking on all the risks that banks often take and without having the liquidity problems that banks run into. Nelson Nash says, if some authoritative power distributed all the money in the world equally among all the people in the world, it would be 97% of the money would be back under control of 3% of the people. Did I say that right? If some authoritative power distributed all the money in the world equally among all the people in the world, within 10 years, 97% of all the money would be back under control of 3% of the people. Why is that? It's because they understand money and how to get it to flow to and towards them. And that's what we want to do. That's why we spent so much time talking about the monetary, you know, money and, and what's money doing and what are the banking systems doing? What's, what's debt doing and, and understanding money. And, and the more we understand money, the more we can change the way we think about money. And then use vehicles like the infinite banking concept to turbocharge our real estate investment strategies, to turbocharge what we're already doing. We, I'm not interested. You're making money. Your real estate investment business is, is going, um, you know, gangbusters. It's, it's, it's awesome. We're not trying to change your strategy. We want to turbocharge it and help you and show you how you can set these up and create a vehicle that's going to grow over and over and over and over and over throughout your whole life. So anyway, sign up for the webinar. It's coming up on the 19th. It is uh, truly only for uh, Boston real estate and uh, it's only for you guys. So sign up. I'm not charging. I'm not going to record it for you to watch later. Unfortunately, you got to be there to watch it. Um, if you cannot be there, please reach out to me. My contact information is up there. Um, I'll put it in the chat as well. Um, but if you cannot be there, please reach out to me. I'm happy to share with you. Uh, we'll just set up a Zoom call, sit one-on-one, -on -one, talk together, and you can ask all the questions you want. Check it out. But thank you so much, guys. Uh, I'm excited to be here and excited to uh, be teaching people about infinite banking. Jason, thank you. Uh, given what has been happening in the banking world very recently, this was spot on, exactly what we needed to hear. And Paul, thank you as well, of course. Yeah, you're do, we have any, do we have any questions from anybody in the room? If so, this is the time to unmute and ask away. Well, people are thinking about a question. One more thing I'll add to like the way I think about it as sort of a customer and, and, and doing this is it's it's something to add to your portfolio. It's not as if like you should take all of your money from everywhere and put it in a whole life, but it is a, a really neat tool that can grow over time and give you a lot of flexibility. So it's one of the things that I invest in and it has, you know, certain kinds of properties you can't really find anywhere else. So it's not like a silver bullet to make you rich in two years, but it is a powerful kind of investment vehicle with a lot of flexibility that that can complement other other types of investments that you engage in. So that's that's how I see it myself. Yep, it's definitely another tool in your toolbox for sure. Yeah, a diversified toolbox. Yes, that's right. Um. I have a question. Because uh, we're here today on this webinar, could be attend absolutely. That I am not charging you for the next webinar. There is no charge for that webinar. Um, so you you sign up, you show up, and I'll teach you. Jason, if if I may, you put up a slide uh, 
with the banks, uh, with Wells Fargo on top. Can you uh, put that uh, put that uh, slide up again or no? Yeah, tell me which one it was. This was the one with the banks uh, and had Wells Fargo on top and, and the rest of the banks were, were below it. This is the one. Uh... When you were talking about how the banks make use of whole life. Yes. If not, that's not a problem. Yeah, let's see. Was it this one? No, no. It had the lines going across. Oh, it was deposits. How much deposits they hold? Their deposit structure. Yeah, that one. That one right there. That one? 23, yeah. yes. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Yep. Annie, you want to go ahead and ask your question? Uh, can you hear me? A little bit. Oh, am I quiet? Sorry, my my microphone. Uh, but I had a question. So earlier you were saying about whole life, uh, people would be trying to get into it and then they would have problems with uh, people who didn't understand how to set it up. Would you recommend a certain a company or, or some place to look at for people who are actually knowledgeable about setting up whole life policies? Um, yeah, I would recommend me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> truly. So I'll, I'll teach you about it. I'll help you set it up. Right. Okay. I'll walk you through the whole Sounds process. Um, I, I would say, so infinite banking, becoming your own banker is a great book to read. Um, he will even say, make sure it's someone who is trained through the Nelson Nash Institute as an authorized IBC practitioner, okay? Um, they say that it's someone who has gone through all of their specific training through, um, you know, the, the extra understanding of Austrian economics and how that works and the money system works. So I'm an authorized practitioner. I've gone through all of that as well. Um, and, and I'm on their list. And so I say you can go there and then look me up. Uh, you can go to the website, but you know, I'll, I'll, I'll teach people all day long and you're going to like it or you're not. There's not really a gray area. I don't need to sell it because I'm not charging you to teach it to you. I'm not charging you to strategize, right? You're going to get a policy if you're going to get a policy, right? And if I find something good for you, you're going to like it and, and you'll get it. Cool. Great, Jason. You teach Hannah and she'll teach me because she's my daughter. <laughs> there you go. Awesome. Get some generational wealth going on there. Yes. Thank you. Yep. All right, guys. Well, thank you very much. If you. Oh, hi. If, who, who if... Oh, oh, it's Deborah. Hi, Deborah. Deborah we hi. We can't, we can't see yeah. you. Yeah. So yeah um if you don't have uh any type of insurance at what age does it not does it no longer make sense to invest in whole life insurance it seems yeah, the earlier you the earlier you get involved the better yeah great question um so I'll expand that question a little bit. I, I get asked that question a lot. How, how is it? How late is too late? Uh, mm -hmm. Also, how much is it to get started? Uh, and tackling those two specifically, how much is it to get started? I have no idea because it is situational. It is based on you and your situation and what we come up with together, right? And so I have clients doing two hundred dollars a month in a policy. I have a guy doing three hundred thousand a year in a policy. Everything in between just depends on what's right for you. Um, uh, as far as age, so it's life insurance. So you need to be insurable. However, let's say you're 75 and you're like, I love this. I want to get started. It's very difficult to get insurance at 75. That's beneficial to you. But if you have children, they have insurable interest to you. So you can be the policy owner on your children and buy the policies on your children. And as the policy owner, you get to access the cash value. So we usually look that way next. If, if your age or your health is, is makes the policy cost prohibitive, we'll look at who has insurable interest around you next. Um, if you're a business owner and you have employees, even more options for you. 
So we just need to look at the situation, mm -hmm. right? Thank you. Great question. Uh, hey, Jason. Hey, my, my internet's bad, so I have to say hey, off video. But, uh, um, let's say I have a ton of insurance policies already that have been in effect for forever. So obviously I started them younger and they get more expensive as I get older every year. Is there any way to transfer what I'm currently dealing with into another vehicle? Yeah, just uh, so so we would have to look at them. But if you have, let's say, I run into it a lot. People will have policies that are not well structured, whole life policies, or even IULs and VULs that are going to price out. Um, Paul's taking off. Thank you, Paul, for coming tonight again. Um, yes, Paul. Thank you. Um, we run into that situation all the time, and we'll look at it. Um, but just like properties, you can do a ten thirty one exchange. Uh, they have what's called the 1035 exchange for whole life policies. We can uh, transfer uh, the cash value. If you have cash value, but the growth rate is lousy and we find that it's more beneficial for you to start a new policy. Um, yes, we can, we can opt in 1035 cash value from the old policy into the new policy. So you don't lose that existing cash value. Um, all right. Now, though, the thing is, you know, when I started these things, I was way younger. And now that I'm 62, yeah, I'm trying to think of financial sense because policies, I mean, they're expensive as they are now every year, you know, paying annually. Um, you know, does it in the end, does it, the number is going to make sense from what you end up paying for life insurance? You know, the, you know, the, does it make financial sense when you're older to do it, though? Um, good question. So again, unfortunately it depends, right? But don't, it's not always about how much extra money do I have? Right. Um, and, right. and sometimes we're looking, we look, want to look at the whole picture, get a full financial snapshot and go, what if I'm just changing the flow of my money? Does, does cost of insurance matter? So there's two parts of a policy structure, your base premium and your what's called PUAs, paid up additions. So your cost of insurance is, is, is priced to your base premium. And, and in the example you gave, Duncan, is, is where we would try to get that base premium really low. So even if your cost was a little bit higher, we want to, it, the cost is on the base. And so we want to get that base really low and, and then have the PUA take over, right? So it's just all, it's all about kind of, you got to run the numbers and, and see what it looks like. But yeah, there's, there's, there's definitely ways. I, it is not uncommon uh, to run into situations like you're explaining. Um, any questions about okay, that? That, that's good. I, you know, I, I know this is, you know, very individualized and personalized for everybody yeah. in their current position, you know, you know, they're monthly they're what they want I, you know i i understand that so it's best just to uh contact you and um you had uh you, you're doing a class soon right yep on on the 19th um mm -hmm. doing one for you guys 19th at 7 p.m and i'll put that i'll yep. put it dropped down in the chat quite a bit so, so i'll put it in the chat again all right, guys, I'm just going to copy that in the, if you haven't gone in the chat yet. Yeah, I'm going to put it in the chat again. Awesome, guys. And, and that's a half, half a day. And uh, uh, no, this know, one, this uh, one we're open to our, we're going to do about two hours uh, on this one. We'll keep it shorter since it's the evening. Okay. Okay. All right. Super. Um, so guys, if you, uh, I'm also recording this, so I'm going to put the replay in a couple of days. So if you want your uh, spouse or partner to hear what this was about um, before, you know, attending, uh, you'll, you'll have access to that before the 19th. Um, and I suggest anyway that uh, you, you rewatch it. Uh, always good for what, what you're going to uh, retain and retention. Um, so this is a great uh, offer that Jace put forward to, you know, Boston Rhea. 
Um, anyone else with some questions? Let's uh, make sure that everybody who's on this call, uh, everyone remaining, uh, that you copy and paste in the chat bar, uh, everything, you can save that to a file on your desktop. That way you have all of that information that everybody posted earlier about uh, contact information and what, what they're interested in when we were networking. Yeah, I always uh, repost the video, but I do not repost the chat. So uh, if you have a have, need, or want, please post it in there and, uh, you know, contact everyone accordingly. Remember our liability statement. Um, so, um, you know, do your research on everything um, and uh, trust and verify. So, uh, Again, uh, guys, thank you for tonight. Get anyone have any more questions, please unmute. Uh, I, I can uh, unmute you. Hold on here. Um, raise your hand. Or you can go in the little uh, reactions thing down at the bottom and raise your hand that way. Um, and we'll get Jason to answer that question. Right, everybody's super quiet. Okay, last chance then. So we're having a shorter meeting tonight, but that's okay. Uh, guys, um, unless I see another hand go up, I'll give you a few seconds to put stuff in the chat bar. Um, okay. Lower my hand. Uh, spotlight Jason for everybody. All right. <laughs> Last chance, guys, before the workshop. Um, all right. Well, in that case, guys, Jason, thank you very, very much. I, I appreciate uh, coming on board um fantastic information um it really was thank you I, I mean, yeah, definitely learned a lot of stuff uh, uh that was new and also was fuzzy in my head now it's very clear so uh again thank you very much and uh um yeah it was great to have the two of you on board so um you might have also created another uh um you know, with Hannah, another uh, uh, disciple of this. So, you know, her ears are perked up. So, you know, better to start Great. as young as you can, as better to start younger than later, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. She's just shy of 25. <laughs> Great. Time. Thank you. Great meeting. Okay. It was. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, All right. for attending. All right. Make sure you sign up for the newsletter. Make sure you're getting all the information. If you have any membership questions, text Kelly. And uh, check out our website. We just redid the entire thing. So make sure you go through and what's new on our website when you get a chance. All right, guys, take care. Have a good evening.